Uh, our next speaker is Paul Coles from Molecule, one of our sponsors. We are really extremely appreciative of your support and look forward to your talk. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Morton. Uh, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. Um, I think first time, we didn't sponsor, but we attended the conference when it was still in Basel, right? 2018? Yeah, the initial ARDD. <laughs> Uh, that feels like a really long time ago in, in um, uh, the aging space. Uh, a lot has happened since then. Um, maybe by way of quick introduction, uh, my name is Paul Kohlhaas. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder uh, of a company and ecosystem really called Molecule. And we are really pioneering new approaches on how to fund research and how to fund science. Um, um, my background to kind of this topic is a bit a atypical. Um, so I spent a lot of time in various online biohacking communities as a teenager. Uh, these were communities looking at aging, for example, uh, looking at diabetes, HIV, um, mental health research. Uh, and I found that really fascinating, kind of this open source nature that the internet really enables us um, uh, to collaborate. Uh, I went on and studied economics. Uh, and during my time studying economics, looked quite deeply at um, biotech stocks and how biotech stocks kind of behave and how they're very, a very different way of financing innovation than grants, for example. Uh, so in this talk uh, today, I wanna look a little bit at um, this new notion that we're working on, which are public markets for IP and how that might be able to finance uh, some of your research. And they have actually already financed some research at the University of Copenhagen together with Morton. Um, so first, I want to look at a little bit what are some of the big issues that we see in scientific research and scientific funding today. So the first thing is that funding today is really highly competitive and asymmetrically distributed. Um, there's even a statistic that many scientists today would change topics uh, and fields if the funding was not a concern. Um, replication. Uh, much of science today is really hard to reproduce. Um, often scientists work in silos and really fail to respect uh, negative results, uh, fail to report negative results. Um, and that really leads to that a lot of scientific uh, insights are really built on invalid data. Um, competition. Uh, science has become hyper-competitive today, which creates really uh, perverse incentives. Uh, the life of a young academic is typically incredibly stressful. There's this notion of publish or perish. Uh, and less than 2% of the NIH's funding, for example, goes to under 35-year-olds. Um, and then the last thing is uh, communication. Science today is really inaccessible, uh, I think, to the, to the broader population. And so much of important scientific literature today really lives behind paywalls. Uh, and so at Molecule, we are asking ourselves the question of how do we change the underlying incentives for scientific research and scientific data to, to become more public and peer-reviewed. So many of these problems today really stem from uh, centralizing authority. Uh, funding today is typically is often uh, distributed by centralized governments or by large private corporations, uh, typically with very little say. So um, patients who are kind of at the end of this really long drug development process have typically really been disenfranchised from participating in what gets funded and, and how it gets funded. Um, and then finally, um, replication, the, the um, centralized scientific communities which use similar methods and involve shared asset are often really hard to replicate. So what could a different system look like? Um, today, in today's system, uh, this was a famous quote um, uh, that we got from a scientist that we're working with. Scientists typically today spend 80% of their time applying for funding and 20% of the time doing the science. Um, and we're really trying to work towards a system where we can flip that upside down. Uh, and then our second notion is that today we believe that most of the world's scientific talent today across the world really remains untapped. Uh, so funding is typically concentrated at a handful of universities uh, across the globe in, in specific areas. And we're really working on this notion of opening that up. So, some of you may have already, actually, let me, let me see a show of hands. Who's heard of the term DSI or decentralized science? Okay, so a fair amount. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm surprised, more, more than I would have expected. Um, so decentralized science is really trying to change that. Um, decentralized science is a movement that aims to build public infrastructure for funding, creating, reviewing, crediting, storing, 
and disseminating scientific knowledge fairly and equitably using Web3 or blockchain technology. Uh, so the goal here are really to enable environments of open collaboration, to enable environments where you can have a trustless exchange of data and of intellectual property rights, and kind of this broader notion of self-sovereign science. So scientific data like, and scientific IP that isn't owned by a particular entity anymore, not by a particular individual, the inventor, but really kind of becomes a public good. Uh, this is something that really happened, um, if you think about it, in the open source uh, software movement. So if you think today that most apps are essentially free to download, uh, and we've developed very different business models around, uh, around software. Uh, remember maybe in the, in the 90s, uh, some of you might still be familiar with the notion of going into like um, an IT store and actually buying a Windows CD uh, and then putting it in, um, in your computer and entering the CD key. Medicine today really works still on that same notion that you essentially go to a pharmacy and you buy a, a licensed uh, product. Um, however, in software development, we completely change that notion. And I think DSI is approaching uh, the notion of IP and collaboration and funding with that in mind. Decentralized Science Today already operates really as a collaborative ecosystem. This is kind of like a, a current landscape of different, um, different DAOs. Uh, decentralized autonomous organization, different protocols and uh, infrastructure that is being built um, for decentralized science. This goes from um, funding women's health research, for example, to synthetic biology research. Uh, there are various communities building on these frameworks. Um, along the following verticals, uh, so there's really these verticals of funding IP and what we have now called bio DAOs or research and development DAOs that are focused on faster, more democratic funding mechanisms and that really enable communities to form and govern around science. Um, many of you have, uh, I'm sure, have met uh, representatives of VitaDAO, so VitaDAO is a really good example, uh, example of this. Uh, then another area is publishing. Uh, another area is reproducibility of data and science. Uh, a last one is identity and reputation. Um, so today what we're really going to focus on are the, is a vertical that is seeing the most progress, which are really DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, and funding of IP. And we're going to look at a couple of very specific use cases. Um, before though, IP as an asset class, if we really, and many of you have probably filed IP or have worked with your uh, technology transfer office, um, intellectual property today as an asset class has really barely evolved or been digitized. In many cases, it actually remains like it's, it remains paper-based. If you have to go to the patent office and you file, get boxes and boxes of papers of filings. Um, and patents, if we really think about how science should work, are really monopolistic and they create perverse incentives. Meaning that if um, a specific entity has a patent on a particular molecule that you as a researcher might want to investigate, you're actually typically barred from doing so. You're, you're disincentivized to work on something that has already been patented. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're really still analog. We live in a completely digital world today uh, where most things have become programmable. Um, they're also illiquid. It's quite hard to transact in patents, to transfer them, or even to use them as an incentive for open science and open collaboration. Uh, and the last thing is if you've ever tried to do a, a licensing deal across a university or across different entities, um, it's incredibly hard to kind of to get to. Um, because we really lack global and standardized frameworks. Um, and at Molecule and in this decentralized science movement, we really see IP as kind of the core carrier asset in, in scientific funding and in scientific funding transactions. Um, so what we're aimed at doing at Molecule is revolutionizing how intellectual property works in early stage drug development and science. Uh, and we've really pioneered this concept of what we call a modular intellectual property development pipeline. So you have an IP creator that uploads an asset into our, into our ecosystem, and then the asset can be fractionalized, and shares can be split between different research groups and, for example, early investors and um, speculators. Um, in a next step, you might then have a patient group get involved, and you might distribute ownership to that patient group in return for contributing research data, or the lab might receive funding in return for research data. Uh, and again, uh, at various stages of development, you have different types of inv investors that get involved in the assets development. And then over time, hopefully, 
um, the asset's value appreciates as it kind of moves through this pipeline. And we'll look at further examples um, of how this is actually already being, being used. Um, so what is the building block? What is actually moving, moving along here? Uh, so we see these, we've developed a new legal and technological primitive, which is called an IP NFT. Uh, so some of you may have heard about, uh, about non-fungible tokens already. Um, uh, kind of became a craze, I would say about two or three years ago. Uh, pictures of monkeys, pictures of cats, and so on. And at Molecule, we asked ourselves, hey, what if instead of attaching a picture of a cat or a monkey, <laughs> we attached a composition of matter pattern? <laughs> so the fundamental basis of describing a new molecule. And what if we also encrypted that? Uh, so essentially what you have now are these, these bearer assets that are on chain. They can be transferred just as you would one of these um, collectible NFTs. But in this case, you kind of, you have a KYC entity, a KYC address, uh, and you can transfer the full legal rights to your research project from one entity to another with the click of a button within minutes. Uh, so these IP NFTs are programmable. So you can, um, you can design automatic royalties or ownership rights. Um, they're meaning, for example, that you can split them now between multiple entities. You can say the IP is owned a third by the university, a third by the inventor, and a third by a first investor. Uh, they're transactable. As I just said, you can transfer them within minutes, and the full legal ownership is, um, is transferred. Um, they're highly liquid. You can now list them, for example. You could, you could list them as you list an item on eBay and say, hey, who wants to bid on, uh, on my early stage IP or on my research project? And then fundamentally, they're data rich. So it's not just a legal agreement, um, but the keys to this NFT really act, um, act as a key to a decentralized storage layer. You can imagine this like a, like a Google Drive where you're now transferring the full ownership of that Google Drive. Um, and what we're really hoping to achieve with this is open up, wait, actually, yeah, let me, let me explain this a bit further. So what the IP NFT reading contains of is a legal contract so you'd have the identities um, uh, of the licensing parties, uh, the walled addresses, uh, and then the terms of the IP deal, and then a smart contract um, uh, where the legal contract is referenced. And then um, you'd have all of the encrypted IP and patent data, whatever essentially you want to, you want to store uh, in the IP NFT. And so what we're really hoping uh, to get to is a much more open market for how innovation is curated and how scientific discoveries are curated. Um, what, you see, uh, what you see on the left here uh, kind of is a typical innovation process um, that happens within organizations. So you have many research projects uh, emerge, you have this process of idea generation, project definition, and then in the end you typically have one or two really ideas or concepts that make it to market. And if we overlay this to the typical drug development process where you kind of have valley of death in academia and industry um, all the way through to approval, it's okay, thanks. <laughs> all the way through to approval, uh, to the approval phase, we have to think today that each organization, each pharmaceutical company or even many laboratories are all doing this work in a silo. So we have global diseases Aging, for example, is, if we recognize it as a disease, is obviously a global phenomenon, but so are many cancers. However, each organization is still kind of working in their own little silo. Um, and the intellectual property system has really, has really facilitated this more as everyone is kind of in this gold rush to discover IP for themselves. Um, and so we hope that a mechanism like the IP NFT can actually enable cross-collaboration uh, through much more open... Um, ways of doing this. This is kind of how this looks like then on, on our marketplace. So you can now imagine that each of these IP NFTs then has a project page. Um, very simple example. It's like most industries today have been kind of revolutionized by marketplace approaches. And so we've developed a marketplace where now, um, uh, where different researchers can upload their IP and, um, uh, and then acquire funding from the market. So what we really do is we make these IP NFTs discoverable and tradable, and this then kind of represents an exchange layer for decentralized science. So who are the primary users of these IP NFT structures today, of these new innovation structures? And there's this new concept called a, a 
Biotech Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or short, a BioDAO. Uh, so many of you have probably come across members of VitaDAO or heard about VitaDAO. VitaDAO is one of these organizations. VitaDAO has already very actively built a portfolio now of over seven different IPNFTs financing research projects uh, across the world. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into how these biotech DAOs work. They're essentially focused on funding of innovation, uh, incubation, um, creating spin-outs, uh, and then really um, reinvesting any of the proceeds that come from financing this research into funding further research. Um, I'm going to speed this up a bit. So to date, VitaDAO, for example, has funded over $7 million, um, $7 million in research, some of which has also gone to the Scheibe Nutzen Lab, the University of Copenhagen. Another project was with Evander Fang at the University of Oslo. Uh, then we had one really interesting project that I'll go into in, uh, in some depth, which is with the Karolchuk Lab at the University of Newcastle. Um, so they've established a drug discovery pipeline for identifying autophagy enhancing small molecules. Um, and as we know, autophagy activation is one of the most promising mechanisms for, of action for geroprotective medicine, uh, really acting as a mimetic uh, of fasting and caloric restriction. Um, so this research project at Newcastle University previously received um, just under $300,000 in funding about one and a half years ago, and then recently, uh, about four months ago, raised follow-on funding through uh, a new mechanism. And this mechanism is essentially now the creation of fully publicly tradable IP tokens uh, to create early liquidity and price discovery for a specific project. So whereas before we have an IP NFT which is essentially entails single ownership of an asset, what you're now doing is you're f fully decentralizing ownership of the asset. Uh, so in this case, over one million of these IP tokens were created for um, this very specific research project at the Karolchuk Lab. And then VitaDAO held a token sale where now members of the public, um, anyone really interested to participate in this research project could now purchase individual ownership in the project. Um, and I think a total of 10% uh, of the project was auctioned off. Um, and kind of coming back to this picture, what's now happening is you're now taking one of these assets and beginning individual distribution to different stakeholder groups. Uh, in, this case, um, uh, in this case, these were um, members of the VitaDAO community. So if you own Vita tokens, you now also have rights to purchase ownership in a very specific asset that VitaDAO is developing. Um, this is one of the most promising assets that, um, that VitaDAO is currently developing. Um, and what, what, can, what, what can Victor Korolchuk now do with these tokens, or what can VitaDAO do with these tokens? So they can effectively now be exchanged for further work on the project, for funding, or even for other IP contributions. Um, and what happened very specifically in this, um, what, what they really enable are open source collaboration, but without losing commercial viability um, to develop the project further. So all of the IP is essentially secured, but what you're doing with these IP tokens are essentially almost creating like, um, like a, a, an IP pool or an IP commons, where if I own these tokens, I can now apply to get specific um, access rights or data rights, or even I can contribute as a researcher into this, into this commons. You can kind of imagine it like a, like a private GitHub repo that has now been created around, um, around this particular asset. Um, and uh, it was a pretty wild success. So there were over 200 participants in this initial sale, um, and the project was 1,700% oversubscribed uh, with about $600,000 in demand. Um, the project now, you can think of this a little bit, Act now has a market capitalization, uh, like we have companies that are trading on a stock exchange or, uh, or certain commodities. This research project now actually has a market capitalization. It's currently sitting at 1.2 million. Uh, so it, when it increased in valuation about 4X from the, uh, from the price. There's also now over 70 different token holders. So these are now token holders that might have specific information requests about the project. They might even make suggestions on what should be developed next. Um, a CEO has actually now been designated or like a project lead specifically just to work on that project. Um, they can now be incentivized in ownership in that project. And um, so where is this going? These tokens were also distributed to the tech transfer office themselves and the university and also um, uh, to Dr. Koralchuk. 
Um, and this, this only happened, I think, about, yeah, about two or three months ago. Uh, and we're really excited. VitaDAO now has a whole pipeline of projects that it's kind of taking into this new financing approach. And yeah, we're really excited to see, to see where this goes. Essentially, what then happens over time is this project might now gain more and more kind of attention and um, as further data emerges. And eventually, the way that these systems are designed, uh, a pharma company could emerge or another biotech company and could say, hey, actually, Victor's research is really interesting and we want to purchase the whole project. Uh, and at that point, for example, token holders could then decide to sell it and to receive the proceeds. Uh, and so it's really a way of speeding up this early stage uh, discovery process. So we want to build towards a world where scientists spend 80% doing the science and only 20% applying for the funding. And we really hope that this, that this new mechanism can enable that. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with one thing. It took, it took us three weeks from the initial, um, uh, the initial introduction to the Newcastle Tech Transfer Office to a full out licensing with them receiving the money in their accounts. Um, and so I think these new communities and these new mechanisms can really massively speed up um, getting funding. And then what's really interesting th is I think having patient and researcher communities govern cures together and also govern the access to potential medication together. Um, and having scientists that are fairly paid and incentivized for their work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. This is uh, you know, inspirational to hear. And we have time for a few questions. Thanks very much. It's a great talk. Uh, beautiful ethos and vision, like absolutely fantastic, you know, thinking. As, as the ultimate skeptic, knowing nothing about Bitcoin and, you know, how anything yeah. works on the back end, the, you know, the obvious question is like, it sounds to the uninitiated, like, just trust us, like, is this all going to work out great? And sort of to extend that, you know, the, the usual thinking and to use Dr. Rando's analogy of kicking the can down the road, mm -hmm. you never know when, you're, when your next kick is a paradigm shift and everything's op everything opens up. Sorry, too much hand talking there, Morton, sorry. And everything opens up into, uh, everything opens up into, into a, a beautiful vista, usually that person. So, so how, how, how do you sort of protect, the, how, 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 does, how does that work? you know, in, in, in the accumulation of IP towards a paradigm shift. How it works when... <laughs> so, so, you know, science is iterative yeah. until there's a paradigm shift. Yeah. And usually that paradigm shift is a nature paper and, and, and a bunch of funding, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And how does the guy who had, you know, step 2.1, you know, not, not come out the loser? Usually people would hoard their IP yeah. till a point of, you know, some sort of breakthrough level to, to their own thinking. I mean, I think ideally you take everyone along, like rather than kind of working in a silo for a really long time, you take everyone along for the ride. So I think, it, I guess it is a bit of a cultural, it requires a bit of a cultural shift of really operating in a more open environment. Um, however, that, that open environment could still be small. So rather than kind of working by yourself, in a small lab, you could still have work with six, seven, eight people, or maybe 20, 30 people that believe in you and that, are, that keep financing like every step of the way, even though it looks dire, until kind of that, that step change is, is achieved. But it, it requires a bit of a cultural shift, definitely. All right, I think we, in the interest of time, we will stop here, but thank you so much, Paul. It's really amazing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. We think that pharma as an industry is fundamentally broken and it's broken because it fails to serve its primary user, which are patients. It's never been more expensive, time consuming or risky to bring new drugs to market. Typically something like 50 to 80% of a very successful researcher's time will be spent trying to garner grant funding, trying to garner private um, investment into the work that they're doing and this is a problem because it really distracts from your ability to do science on a day-to-day -day basis. And so at Molecule we began asking ourselves how could we fundamentally change the incentives and value drivers within the pharmaceutical ecosystem. And we asked ourselves what would happen if, if patents and intellectual property ownership and data ownership moved out of companies and out of organizations, um, academia, 
into the public domain. We believe that we can unleash the full potential of researchers by really making more and more time available for the fundamental work that they want to do, and that's being at the bench, coming up with good ideas, and actually moving these advances from the discovery phase to market. We do that by creating a very easy to use interface where the researcher can just upload the information around their project, explain what they're doing, explain the impact, and specify the funding that they need, and then communities, whether it be a patient who's interested in a cause, a biotech company that likes, uh, really likes this idea and wants to support you, can very easily commit funding and you can get to work. We really envision researchers that are interested in working with communities, working with patients, and trying a different funding approach from what is typically common uh, within the status quo. So if you're somebody who's interested in having a patient or a patient advocacy group directly fund your research and have a role in governance over how that research ultimately comes to market, Molecule might be the right place for you to seek funding.